Good morning and afternoon, everyone. I'm definitely trying to hit all the time zones with that welcome. I don't think we have anybody from the evening here. We are certainly delighted to welcome you to our Horizon Connect series, a new copyright solution for universities. I'm your host today, Holly Ludgate, the Senior Director of Program Development for the NMC. Sit back, get comfortable, enjoy the following presentation from two of our esteemed faculty from Stanford University. First, we have Martha Russell. Martha Russell is Executive Director of Media X at Stanford University and Senior Research Scholar at the Human Sciences and Technology Advanced Research Institute at Stanford, is a fellow with the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics and Senior Fellow at the Institute of Innovation, Creativity, and Capital at the University of Texas in Austin. Dr. Russell studies innovative ecosystems during data-driven visualization methods for systems analysis. Russell's current research focuses on network analysis of interfirm relationships to identify patterns in emerging business sectors, publishing, mobile, and green tech, investor networks, and global business development. Russell is an organizational interface activist specializing in technology transfer between academic and industry researchers. She's established collaborative research initiatives in technology leadership and information sciences for national science agencies and technology companies, which has led to interdisciplinary research programs for the University of Minnesota and the University of Texas at Austin. She organized the Internet2 Socio-Technical Summit of 1999, inviting social scientists and engineers at IT universities and in industry to collaborate, a research agenda and high bandwidth communications for the social sciences. Next, we have Franny Lee. Originally, she's a composer and jazz musician. Franny Lee was drawn to the fields of copyright and digital communication by experiencing firsthand its effect on music industry. She has worked on these complex issues from many perspectives for over 10 years. Franny is a lawyer in the US and Canada and was an intellectual property litigator with Castles Brock and Blackwell LLP in Toronto, specializing in digital rights and internet issues from the entertainment, media, and communications industry. Franny's work includes creating national copyright royalty tariffs before the Copyright Board of Canada and litigating decision appeals in higher courts. Franny clerked for the Copyright Board and Copyright Collective Certification Proceedings and Orphan Works application and consults for the Board on research issues, policy initiatives, and administration of copyright collecting societies. She holds a Master of Law degree in Law, Science, and Technology from Stanford Law School, an LLB slash JD from Queens, and a BFA from New York. She is a fellow of CodeX, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, and her research focuses on technology to improve the copyright landscape. So as you can see, we have really a set of esteemed colleagues today from Stanford, but we're very excited to, uh, as you can see, be viewing right now, and we're going to be hearing from in just a minute. So let me go ahead and turn it over to you two and say welcome, and here's the floor. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Holly, for that very nice introduction. The X at Stanford University is a catalyst organization, industry facing, and has as its objective stimulating discovery collaborations that are interdisciplinary at Stanford and uh, bridge the university and industry membership organization. And it's the questions that our members bring to us that um, inspire the research that we do. We work with a wide variety of centers across campus, um, including CODEX, which is a center finding interests of law school. And so we've got legacy companies, we've got growth companies, we've got new startups that are all entering this space, uh, this ecosystem um, through which course materials get created and uh, curated and uh, consumed by uh, in higher education. We can see these relationships in a number of ways. And one of the ways that uh, my group at Stanford looks at it is through the alliances that take place uh, between them, through the relationships that people at the founder, the board level, or the funder level have with the organizations. Um, and we map out those relationships um, in an ecosystem map. But I'm curious, and this would be a good time to use poll number one to say, uh, to ask you, if any of your uh, organizations um, are, if you're aware of products or services for higher education publishing industry that are being created by people at your institution. It's a time of great innovation um, in this sector. And um, 
I'm going to show you in just a moment a couple of pictures that uh, evidence the uh, incredible amount of innovation that is um, taking place, uh, much of it um, coming out of universities. So um, there are, of course, incremental innovations that take place, but this looks like a disruptive innovation. And we look at, we map the relationships that people who are working for companies have and the relationships that financial organizations or angels have in providing those funds to the companies because it's through those relationships that information and talent and resources uh, are, are transmitted. If we um, look at the startups that have happened in the past year, this is the kind of um, ecosystem map that we get. These are all in the publishing industry. Uh, the red are showing startup companies. The blue are showing the angels <clears throat> that are a part of them, uh, who have founded them or, or on the board. Um, you see in yellow the locations in San Francisco, New York, London are prominent locations. You see in an aqua color uh, the theme of the company and digital media, social media uh, are very pronounced. And uh, there are about just short of 2,000 companies that have started up in the past 18 months in the publishing area. So looking at um, Stanford and Palo Alto and Silicon Valley and our location um, is, of course, of interest to the work that we are doing. And there are quite a number of angels, quite a number of uh, companies that are starting up. And the whole industry just to take a, an overview, is uh, undergoing dynamic innovation. There are a lot of universities that are participating. There are a lot of eager investors um, in, from angels or VCs, and uh, Stanford is in a key location. So we, so we feel some responsibility uh, in that and, and responsibility to step forward to one of the big challenges that has been identified in higher ed, meaning the cost of course materials. And um, this is a concern you know, across the country, around the world. It's a concern both for educators and libraries, but also for publishers and service providers. And um, we try to get a feeling of uh, where are the costs coming from. Um, and this pie chart shows you a breakdown in costs coming from some of the research that Franny and colleagues have um, done uh, looking specifically at course materials at Stanford. The royalties, of course, uh, account for a substantial portion of that. The delivery costs a portion, the overhead margins and transaction fees for assembling, and, and the printing costs are there as well. So our question, um, one of our core driving questions was can we something with legal informatics to reduce that cost? Um, can we help to reduce the liability that schools and educators are facing as they're exposed to risk for misuse of uh, fair use or, or um, orphan works? And um, in this context, I'd like to put out the question, um, poll number two, in terms of um, institutions um, wanting to know and I'd like to know, we'd like to know if your institutions have identified the cost of course materials as an issue of concern. And uh, we'd be interested in knowing just how that um, concern has been defined and who are the flag bearers for it. Maybe we can get to some of that in our discussions a little bit later. So our questions um, that were you know, through MediaX that came to us from our member companies um, revolved around this. What are the issues of audience participation on the internet? In 2005, before consumer-generated content was a term, it became aware that uh, obvious that people who were using the internet wanted to participate. And so what were the issues there? But also, what are the causes of content licensing inefficiencies in higher education? And how can legal informatics technology be used to alleviate the licensing inefficiencies, specifically for course materials. And we're very interested in how Publish on Demand is changing higher education. 
So the collaborative discovery that we have um, been engaged in over the past, well, now about seven years, has been um, implemented through action research with iterative use cases. Taking here's an instance, what can we learn in this instance that will give us the requirements for what a solution would need to be? And our collaborators have included uh, libraries at Stanford, the bookstore, professors, students, Media X member companies, a variety of Stanford departments, and many others. So it's been very much an in situ uh, discovery that has uh, led to some insights um, and uh, to some solutions. And to give you a little bit of background, um, and by in doing that, introduce you to some of our um, team members and collaborators. My name is Franny Lee, and I'm the Associate Director of the Stanford Intellectual Property Exchange. I like to say that I do law because I love music. Fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. I was a musician. I was a jazz vocalist. And what I do now I see as the extension of trying to help people be creative and find ways to support themselves in being artists. Jupiter or Mars. I fundamentally believe in copyright law because at the base of it, it's a method for society to continue improving itself. Copyright is important because it provides stimulus to creators to continue to try to create. It's embedded in our Constitution, and the resulting copyright code is intended to make it uh, possible for those who create copyrightable materials, books, articles, journals, films, music, to uh, get some reward for having created these items if they're uh, used and paid for in the marketplace. Whether it's in an academic environment or a user-generated content environment, like someone making a video for YouTube and wants to pair it with a the song they hear, it's really hard to figure out who you need to get rights from, what kind of rights you need to get. If you make it easier for people to, to understand what their rights are in content and to use content legitimately, you will get more legitimate use. The CIPIX project is a system that helps make copyrights easier to the everyday person. It gets the law out of the way. And particularly copyright law shouldn't be an impediment to innovation. And, and our system is just trying to make it easy, it simplifies it. We're asking the question, can we in fact make it possible for computer systems not just to um, process the law as documents that humans need to read, but can we actually render the law into a form, a computable form, that computers can work with to do legal analysis or limited legal analysis in certain domains, to look at the data about a situation and to suggest that a person might be in violation of one or other laws or regulations. We've deployed CIPIX at Stanford campus now, so we are facilitating over a thousand students. We provide the print-on-demand course readers. One of the primary businesses of Konica Minolta is printers. In particular, they have a printer which prints books, not just papers. So if you send the documents to the printer, it will output a book, a bound book. So it seemed to us that there was an opportunity there for course readers. The professor has a variety of articles. He would like to, to combine them together and produce a book. The beauty of their printer is it's custom printed. He can push the button, it will print, and he can pick it up in a matter of minutes or hours. If we have to intersperse, a process of copyright clearance that takes days, it destroys that potential. CIPIX is agnostic to the type of distribution it does. All it really cares about is how to help people do their copyright transactions faster. So in the print-on-demand setting, it's the same technology that's facilitating the digital setting, and we are giving students, in many of these cases, um, a choice of what they'd like to consume their educational materials in. Well, before CIPEX happened, the course reader used to be done through the Stanford Bookstore. It was first very long and second very expensive for students. This time around, it seemed to me that the process was very quick. We started in early March 
uh, to get the copyright cleared and within just a few days the, the person I was working with got back and said yes we got everything cleared and this time around we were able to get the entire thing assembled printed to the student for $48. So it's a significant cost savings for the student. And one of the things we check against is uh, whether or not the person who wants to use this copyright already has permission to use it. And these things happen more often than you would think. We're building a real solution, yeah, which is not sort of the typical thing people do in law schools. Uh, so for me, that's, that's, that's very, very exciting to have this opportunity to work on projects that actually you know, become real solutions. Media X I see as um, one of the catalysts that have brought all of this together. It's probably a project that would not have happened if Media X had not been there to help to put us in touch with, in this case, our funder, and to get the funding to get us to the point where we are today. We're hearing from General Counsel of Stanford that because it's been made so much easier to clear copyrights, that we are helping the school lower its copyright infringement liability. The professor and the researcher on the Publish and Demand project in the Media X is giving us a lot of uh, valuable information and also valuable aspect and a different angle to us. This is a very great opportunity for us. What I want CIPIX to do is fix copyright so that creativity can flourish and society will get literature and art and music and authors will get paid and be able to support themselves on what they create and continue to create and continue to hone their crafts. And I feel like this is an important place for me to be. Great, thank you very much for showing that, Holly, and, and it, I think, gives people a sense of um, the background and a number of the players. Um, that were, have been part of uh, the CIPICS project. And leading up to uh, the NMC Summer Conference, um, here you see Franny on the left and uh, Bob Weinshank standing in for me uh, on the right. And uh, we were very pleased with the response that the um, application uh, and that our poster received at the NMC. And um, this would be a good time for me to turn it over to Franny and ask her to uh, tell you in detail how it works. Absolutely. Um, I feel like I'm continuing the shameless self-promotion right now. Uh, so, so, you know, thank you very much to NMC for this exciting opportunity to talk with you all and get your ideas as well for how we can make CIPIX applicable to the university experience even more so. Um, you know, we had a great response at the summer conference. Our poster um, took best in show for poster presentations and, um, and I think People's Choice as well. And it was really um, one of the first times that we'd taken our fledgling company, Cipix Inc., out into the public to see what the response was like. So you see on the right-hand side, Bob Weinshank is the CEO of Cipix Inc., and I'm coming in as the VP of University Relations and Business Development. And really, CIPIX Inc. is a new company that has been formed to bring the CIPIX technology out from Stanford and to share it with the world. Well, what I'd like to do in my section is to highlight the challenges that are being faced by universities that we've experienced and studied during our research phase as the Stanford Intellectual Property Exchange and then I'd like to move into an overview of CIPIX to help you understand what the technology does, and then to um, discuss a little bit about the effects we've seen on Stanford campus. Um, I'll, I'll take the last few slides to show some of the current experiences we're doing. We're also moving into the MOOC space as well, onto online education platforms like Coursera. So there's going to be plenty of time left over after that to discuss um, you know, how you think this might be applicable, what else you might like to see um, in terms of CIPICS coming to your school. So to begin, in, in this slide, and I'm sure for the university attendees, you're already intimately familiar with these issues, but there are a lot of copyright challenges in the university space. Um, whether you're coming in from the libraries or the technical um, solutions side, uh, everybody shares these pain points. 
Um, one is that schools would like to maximize the access to educational resources for their community, to bring as much article and textbook and video and, and visual um, material to their students and professors as possible. The next is to provide copyright tools and support to their community so that people understand what they can do with material and if they need permission to do something, how to get that permission. And that leads into the third challenge, which is how to minimize the school's risk for copyright infringement for all of this content. And the fourth challenge that we'd like to highlight here is it's difficult as well to try to communicate and fully leverage the resources that you do buy for your school community because there is much complexity in all of those agreements. And the challenges in making those, those, in bringing those issues to resolution um, come from a number of different factors. Legal ambiguity is a huge one. So here, every school, I'm sure, has copyright notices that go out to their school community every year that asks the students and the professors to respect copyright and to review the policies and the guidelines of the school. Uh, now, guidelines can only be so helpful when the subject matter of your guidelines are designed to be ambiguous. So professors are often left in this impossible situation of trying to make very complex legal determinations that will require a judge's expertise or a copyright lawyer's expertise to, to figure out. So one of the poll questions that we'd like to push out to you is on questions like fair use, have you heard, um, are, are you aware of concerns by your institution? I think these results are broadcasting, but it seems an overwhelming amount, yes. And what we like to do is to try to think of tools that can maybe not solve the entire problem, but push the community and empower them towards understanding more of the situation and helping them take those next steps in making the right decisions. Other challenges that are faced are the procedural complexity in trying to get something done. So this is a, a small shot, and I know it's very tiny font, but what it's really meant to graphically show is the professor trying legitimately to get materials to the student and going through this loopy, full of dead ends process where their requests are being ignored, they can't figure out who the owners are, it's becoming much too expensive, it's taking too much time. Um, and, and there are frustration thresholds for the professors when they're trying to do things legitimately. And once they hit that threshold, they'll either drop the article and, and that becomes a less rich educational experience for the student, or they'll simply give up on the process and use the materials anyways. And that causes infringement risk for the student. The other procedural complexity that's involved here is often the subscription information isn't being connected to the tools that the professor uses to send materials out to their students. So when you, when you consider that professors, in most cases, are using learning management systems, you also have to think, well, for him, for the professor to understand what the student already has rights to use, he either needs to go consult, perhaps um, a staff member at the library, or go do searches through the library's own subscription uses and the, the subscription contracts which are often very technical, uh, very technical legal language contracts. Uh, and in these cases, that information just isn't communicating itself across because it's too hard to find and it's not being presented properly. We'll move forward into the next challenge, which is how do you do more with less? So as library budgets are shrinking and endowments are shrinking, Educators are asking for more and more content, but libraries are being squeezed because they can't afford as many subscription licenses as they used to. So how do we find that balance in between all, buying a whole subscription or nothing? Um, how do we get easy pay-per-use access to a researcher? So if only four professors wanted to use a particular journal and there isn't the budget to buy a whole subscription, those four professors can still find an easy way to see that content. And that brings us to the overview of SIPIC, which is, you know, with all of these challenges in mind, we looked to design an online rights management system that has these following principles. 
we want it to work within the existing infrastructure of a school. We don't want to have to retrain professors and students to use new software or use new platforms. We, and one of the fundamental building blocks for us was transparency and transparency to the consumers to know what they're paying for and to know um, in the future, one of the features we'd like to bring in is to know what uh, substitutable pieces, substitutable articles are priced at as well. So they have choice. Um, to the consumers, or to the owners, the publishers, transparency is also key because they'd like to get insights into how their content is being used on these platforms. Um, a third principle is it must be automated. We must make it faster for all the processes to complete. Um, it has to be easy to use or people won't use it. And by far the most important principle for us was it has to make things cheaper. So I'll bring you into a top level overview of what CIPIX is. At the core, it's a rights repository and it is governed by pricing and access rules. It sits between content owners who are able to register their content in and apply their rules and on the other side, it, it sits across from consumers. And the two key benefits that we try to bring into the consumer space is the concept of easy pass, which is no longer do you have to go to 10 different publisher websites to purchase each particular piece. Now there is one system that gives you rights cleared access centrally. And the second concept, which is license filtering. And license filtering is CIPIX's unique approach to copyright analysis, which is when a, a user comes in to request content, we don't assume they have no rights. We assume they're coming in with certain affiliations and that those certain affiliations apply certain discounts. So in the academic context, the most common affiliation discount is library subscriptions. So what CIPIX does is when a student comes in to purchase access to a document, we first look at who they are, we look at what their school affiliation is, and then we are able to apply that school's library subscription information as well to bring the price down as much as possible. At the user level experience, the professor simply types in a keyword search. So CIPIX's search fields are very basic. It's title of the piece, author of the piece, um, a simple keyword search will pull up a list of results. And as the professor clicks on his desired article, it embeds the CIPIX uh, registration information and, and proxy link into the system. So when the student comes in to click that CIPIX proxy link to retrieve the reading they need to do for class, the system is first authenticating the student and checking for discounts. And then it transacts any necessary royalties and it delivers the content forward to the student in their choice of print or digital reading, depending on how the system is set up for the school. On the content owner user side, um, they are seeing their revenues coming in as well as their usage analytics. This gives a more wholesome picture of what's happening at the user level. Professor comes in, and, and this is the instance of a learning management system, um, does his keyword search, and as he clicks his results, the links embed themselves into the LMS. On the flip side, the, the student logs in, um, authenticates through the university login, and they read in their usual learning management system all of the different readings they must do. So as they click the link, all of that magic that's happening is being done on the back end. So if you follow the circle around, the rights holders have entered their content pricing information in terms of use into CIPIX, and this information is being generated forward for the student dynamically. On the same token, the professor, if he has his own work, can also register his own content and set his own access terms in there as well. And the library information has come in on the flip side to, um, to identify if it attaches to this certain work. So I'd like to stop here for a poll question because one of the issues that has been quite interesting for us has been what type of format um, do students prefer to consume their materials in? And at this question, we'd just like you to click if it's digital, print, or perhaps a combination of both. Forward, I'd like to show you a little peek under the hood 
at how CIPIX does all of this. So when you think of CIPIX, it's easiest to think of it as a very fast and smart database. Uh, it connects with many other partners and many other databases. And each of these other partners can provide a little piece of the complete puzzle that a, uh, that a university professor needs to know, but they don't complete the whole solution. So CIPIX has come into the space and organized all of these different pieces into three key functions. The first thing we try to do is to find an actual copy of the digital content to deliver it forward to the student. And for that, we work with a number of partners. We work with uh, Internet Archive to make sure that not only copyrighted materials, but royalty-free materials are brought into the system as well. Um, we work with aggregators for content, and we work directly with publishers. Um, where our system does not have a, an actual copy of the article, the professor has the option of uploading their own article. And what will happen is in the next function, um, the professor's copy will be matched with the copyright pricing and the conditions of use information that we collect from a number of other partners. So these could be library partners, such as the Stanford University Libraries and Academic Information Resources. It could be the Copyright Clearance Center that we partner with as well, or, or different aggregators um, for newspapers, for, for other sources, as well as directly with publishers. And this information is only useful when you bring it forward to the point where professors are actually putting the material out to students. So this is where we connect with different types of content distribution systems. In the print space, we have a print partner, Konica Minolta, but we can also interface with, with whatever print installation your uh, university has installed. And we also are very excited to move forward into the digital setting as well. So we work with learning management systems. Uh, Stanford is run on a Sakai platform, as well as um, online platforms like Coursera, uh, we are piloting with Coursera this fall, actually starting next week, um, to be able to bring CIPIC 6 technology not only in an institutional setting, but in the combined setting of institutional with the rest of the world. We've been able to see firsthand uh, from the, the research done through the Stanford Intellectual Property Exchange what benefits this technology has brought into the higher education space. So some of these are, are very simple um, easy to understand tangible benefits. On average, um, through the five deployments of CIPIX's technology we've had on Stanford campus, we have averaged a reduction in course pack and, or course materials. Uh, this includes the digital space um, of $30. We are hearing from the libraries that they feel now that they are getting full value for their subscriptions and that students are no longer paying twice. You know, paying once through the library subscriptions that they have supported through their tuitions, but also um, you know, in cases where that information is not brought forward into their content distribution channel, um, paying second time for that duplicate royalty for the course pack. So getting full value of library subscriptions means saving all of that money for your student. Uh, we have, through this system, been able to see real-time copyright support for the community now. The professors are being able to see the pricing right off the bat, and if they want to switch out their, their materials for something less, or if they, um, are, are, uh, if, if they have received a notice that this piece requires manual support that CIPIX also completes for them, but will take more time, they have been able to factor that piece of data into their decision making for what goes into a course pack and complete that process very, very quickly. Um, we have increased instant access for pay-per-use content for the, for the researchers, professors, and students. And one surprise that we didn't expect, but, but we are hearing from our, our um, professors about, is it's actually been encouraging more academic collaboration. Um, researchers have been able to share CIPICS links instead of PDFs. So when they share a CIPIX link, they can set the price at zero, um, define who they want to access this particular CIPIX link, and when they email that CIPIX link out, they know that only those specific people can open the link and see their draft. 
as opposed to a PDF where if it is emailed further and further downstream, there are no controls. MOOCs have been quite an exciting area for us. Our first deployment is with Coursera this fall. Stanford has also created a platform called Class2Go that is both um, internal at Stanford and a public-facing course. And this online education is just growing and growing with edX, with Udacity, and all of these other initiatives. And what we've heard from the MOOC platforms is that they don't have the bandwidth to handle the copyright clearance responsibilities, and that's being pushed back to the different universities right now. So Stanford in particular was an interesting um, test for us because there is a social science course going out this quarter that uses about 30 different third-party proprietary articles. And for that to happen as a Coursera course, um, it, it was not something that the, the professor or the school could have afforded to buy licenses for on behalf of all of the potential 40,000 students. So we are using the CIPIX technology to bring third-party education options into the MOOC space. And because of our relationships with publishers, we've actually been able to leverage heavily discounted royalties. And the final result being at standard pricing, um, the CIPIX, uh, the, the third-party research, or third-party articles would have cost about $173. And with CIPIX technology, it's actually brought the cost all the way down to $83. We've been able to do this much, much faster. And just to show you a few screenshots of the actual system, this is CIPIX embedded within coursework, which is the Sakai platform for Stanford. The student in the background here is able to click the link for their textbook differential vector calculus, and it appears on their screen just like it would in the usual experience for the student. What they're seeing is the, um, the information, the bibliographic information about the the textbook. They are seeing um, what their terms of use are. It's a license for personal use to view, print, and download. They're seeing credit to the libraries or the faculty for, for a discount, if a discount is applicable, and they're seeing their price. So the Stanford student here, their price is zero. They've been authenticated as a Stanford student, and that, that pricing has factored in, whereas list price for the rest of the world is $7. Once the student clicks to buy document, the document simply opens in their screen like their usual online educational experience. Oh, and I've done it again. I've forgotten to do the poll question. The poll question, poll number five, uh, was the question that involved MOOCs and seeing how many of your universities are involved right now in developing open online courses. So please do um, click as is applicable to your university. I'll turn it back over now to Martha to discuss some next steps uh, for the Media X side. And, and we would also like, in the next slide, I'll, I'll come back and talk about how, if you are interested in learning more about CIPICS and participating, uh, how we can move forward as well. Great. Thank you, Franny. And uh, thanks to the audience for your attention. We are so pleased that the CIPICS technology has been successful in the four quarters at Stanford so far uh, in which it's been implemented and we're very excited about the new frontiers that will have taken place this summer and are going into the fall. And we're very excited about the ability to make it available to other institutions as well. Um, continuing alongside of that though is additional research. Um, under the Publish on Demand theme and uh, under a new theme, uh, which we are calling the Future of Content. And uh, the Publish on Demand theme is continuing to focus on higher education. Uh, it's looking at uh, a number of um, opportunities in both in text but in other media formats um, in which individuals can, without approval, without um, infrastructure, but just create content and get it out there, click to publish. Uh, there are a couple of papers that, uh, white papers that have been produced that we would be very happy to share with you. If you'll um, make a note um, in one of the note taking places here or send me a, 
an email, I would be glad to share those white papers with you. Our new theme um, on the future of content is really opening up the question and asking how in the future will content be created and consumed and curated. Um, our lens on this is particularly looking uh, into education, but we're looking at teachers, at administrators, at students, their families. We're looking at education that is lifelong and life-wide. So it really is uh, wide open. Um, we're excited about these new research themes uh, and the continuing research that we'll be doing and invite collaboration for any of you who are um, also exploring these themes. And as I mentioned, we'd be glad to share um, the white papers that are listed here. Um, and Fanny can tell you about getting involved with CIPICS. We've designed a CIPICS introductory program to help universities take on the technology very easily. Um, it's a three-phase program and it's designed to take you through the steps um, slowly but um, firmly forward. Um, it's designed to run each phase with a consecutive quarter, so that by the end of the third quarter, you're fully integrated with the CIPIC system. The first phase really involves no effort on the school's part to integrate. What we need at a basic minimum is the institutional holdings information from the library, which is typically if you have a software system such as SFX or Serial Solution, is simply an upload of the institutional holdings file. Um, there are no civics fees involved with, with phase one, and that's, uh, that's, that's the great news about all of this. Uh, and, and you migrate through the phases as you see value. So it's the opportunity to bring civics onto the campus for an immediate start, show tangible benefits, and then continue to grow. Our growth goals for the remainder of this year are to introduce civics to three to five more schools um, with a January 2013 target start date. Um, we've committed two of those spots already to Northwestern and to UC Riverside. Um, and, and I think what we'll try to do is, is we'll try to accommodate as many as we can for January 2013 and then, and then, and then grow out the rest of the list um, as fast as possible. Um, it really involves in phase one, you choose up to 10 courses, we work with those professors and we handle digital distribution through the learning management system. Um, again, it's just all we need is a course syllabus and the permissions to access the institutional holdings file. In this case, the students create their own civics account, so payment is also handled entirely through our system. The fees to the school in phase one are nothing and the fees to the student would be um, CIPICS usually charges a 25 cent transaction fee per royalty cleared. So that is waived as well. And what the student simply pays are the pass through costs of copyright royalties to the publisher and the credit card transaction fees. And as we move into the second and the third phase, um, there are, you can add more and more courses. And what we found is um, the professors will start talking amongst themselves and there will be more people attracted into the system. Um, in the second phase, we do ask that the school contributes $1,500 to operational costs. And we start talking also about the deeper integrations that are made available. So we can bring our search boxes directly into the learning management system. We can engage in the password systems, the single sign-on for your school as well. Um, and all of these integrations are to help bring deeper benefits for your school. So the more integrations we can do, the easier it is for your professor or your student to have all of the CIPIC's benefit in one place and to get maximum value and maximum discount. So we'd like to, um, you know, if you are interested in, in trying out the CIPIC's introductory program, please do email me. It's franny at cipics.com. And if you are in a position where you need even more immediate help than that, particularly with the MOOC spaces, um, we are actively servicing MOOC courses right now. And, and we would love to hear from you there as well. 
Oh, Holly, I'll, you know, I, I, can we turn it over to, to questions? Let's take some questions, yeah. Love to know uh, the thinking of the people who have been listening, and um, I think that Holly has been collecting some questions. Let's take a few of those. Sure. So one of the first questions we have is, how might somebody become more involved with CIPICS? Um, well, I guess the first step is let us know you're interested. And at that point, we can talk about what your needs are. Um, I think at this point, we're really excited about working with schools. And we have the benefit of being an early company and having the flexibility to do a little sausage making and more customization than what might be op uh, offered in a later, more mature company. So we really do want to hear about what your needs are and how we can design CIPICS to meet those. Excellent. Um, and so, Andrea, I know you asked that question if you just want to drop your information in. So, um, Franny and Martha can contact you for more, with more information. I did have another question. Uh, somebody had asked for your twiddle, Twitter handle, Franny, and I didn't have that. Um, it's sorely inactive right now. <laughs> so, what I do, uh, we're, we're at about day. You know, we're less than a month old as a company, so there is going to be an active social media set up, but we're just at the point of starting to create that. I will say this, if you'd like some website information, it, uh, the Stanford Intellectual Property Exchange um, Stanford research information is posted at cipics.stanford.edu. Maybe I'll type that into the, the chat here. And we are working like mad to get our corporate website up right now, which will be at cipics.com. So through cipics.com, we will be hosting um, the, the typical social media outlets. This presentation is, it comes at a really good time because it is, uh, the company is very fresh and new. And um, we feel that NMC is really the best group to get the early word um, out and to begin interacting with some of the early opportunities. So um, questions just such as this that let us know that uh, you'd like to know the Twitter handle are very meaningful <laughs> at this stage. Well, we certainly uh, from the NMC appreciate it. I know we're, we're just about out of time um, and I anticipate that more questions are going to roll in maybe even specifically to you both through your email. Um, so to wrap up, I really want to thank Dr. Russell and Franny on behalf of the NMC, you know, taking the time to present today on CIPIX and helping us learn more about it and how we might be able to utilize it, um, whether through the MOOC or on our campus. Uh, participants, if you do want more information on anything that you saw today, you know, let us know in this chat window. And also, if you want to access the slideshow, we do have a SlideShare account. If you haven't checked it out, I highly encourage you to. We will be posting this uh, presentation on our SlideShare account, as well as the webinar archive will be on the NMC site soon. Um, I do have one more question before we go, I'm sorry. Um, Debbie asked if you are working with other MOOC platforms in Coursera, they've been told that Coursera is going to be limiting their platform. So I didn't know if you wanted to respond to that before we head out today. Uh, sure thing. Um, the second online platform that we've built into is the Stanford One Class to Go. Um, the technology is really simple, though, and it's designed to be able to give, uh, uh, it, it's link-based. So to the extent that anyone has a MOOC uh, course that they need help with, um, we will, of course, talk with the MOOC platform to make sure that all you know, any channels are smoothed over. But there's nothing stopping a MOOC professor from using a CIPICS link on their website and bringing that technology in themselves. It really is a matter of posting a CIPICS link on your web page. And at that point, when someone clicks that web page, all of those CIPICS benefits and the copyright analysis is being done. So, so we've designed it to be as simple as possible to implement. It just needs to be posted somewhere. Wonderful. It's highly interoperable. Yes. Thank you both very much, and I hope everybody has a terrific day.